we're all lost, okay? At one time or another, many times in our lives, we're always straying away. We're always trying to go somewhere else. But at your baptism, you will recognize the voice of the Good Shepherd. So that wherever you go, yeah, even when you're running away from him, that little small voice, you know, will be pricking you. Your conscience is pricking you because the Trinity has taken residence in your soul. You will never feel like home until you're home, you're back. And I do return in Catholics, believe me, I know. They tell me the before and after, before they came back and after they come back. So, after baptism, we say once a Catholic, always a Catholic. You will not be at peace until you come back to your home. Which is the fullness of the truth. Once you have tasted Eucharist, which means you have tasted heaven, you will never be at peace. Your soul has tasted heaven, whether you realize it or not. So that when you're away, you will feel it. You wonder why. You're restless. You have all these ulcers. You have all these things going on because you have, have been starving for the bread of life. If you go away, you're going to be starving for the bread of life. And you will be thirsting for the blood of Jesus. I said last week, I used the word dehydrated. You have stayed away from the living waters. And Jesus is the living water. Okay. So, where do you get this living water? Where do you get this bread of life? Only at the Mass. That's where the host, the bread, is consecrated. The wine is consecrated. And it becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, next week we're going to go more into the Eucharist. Eucharist, But I'm going to give you now the Mass itself. The liturgy. I know there's a lot of handouts that you're supposed to be reading, meditating on, especially during these weeks and especially during Holy Week. So, the Mass, and I'm giving you a lot, which are a lot of history. So, first you have the Mass and the liturgy in the back, but you have, we use this, you know, for the kids, but it's so effective for the adults so it gives you you know what happens and big letter m right there and a small m here okay get your handouts so you can follow so what happens at the mass behind behind this handout are the parts of the mass okay you have the parts of the mass there but behind the big m but what's going on really so you have the procession of the entrance song. So we're all there gathering. You come to Mass with everything again. Everything you have, your entire being, you bring to Mass. This is so important that God made it one of the commandments. That you keep His day holy. If we didn't think we need it, He created us. He knows what we're made of. He knows what we're capable of. He needs... He knows what our problems will be. He already saw everything in our life before we were born because he can, remember, he conceived us first in his mind. Before all, 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 before Adam and Eve, he conceived all of us in his mind and he already saw, you know, when we're going to die, what we're going to be, where we're going to end up in. He already saw that. Okay? We are traveling this journey because we're so tiny in this creation, but he's so big that what takes us billions, trillions of years takes him an instant, and he is forever what? Present. Present. God has no past or future. He's always present. In our past and in our future, he's present. He is eternally present. 
Okay, so he manufactured us. He's, he has a manufacturer's manual, I keep saying, and he knows how we work best. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what we need. He made it into a commandment, and Jesus fulfilled it by dying on the cross. Let's stop right now because people are wondering, why is everything covered in purple? You go to the church. The central, you know, the icon there is covered in uh, burlap and then purple cloth. And all the statues are covered in purple. That's a tradition we do at Lent. Remember purple in our lesson on the liturgical year? Purple is what? Sign of penitence, especially during Lent. But in Advent, everything is purple. But it's royal purple. The king is coming. But both, both times, Lent... And Advent, we're supposed to clean up house, repent, because the king is coming. You have a guest coming into your soul, and that's the Lord. Okay? So purple is a sign of mourning, mourning your sins. Okay? You know, being sorry, sorrowful for your sins. Both times, Advent and Lent. But Advent, obviously, you are preparing for the birth of the Lord. Let you're preparing for his death and his resurrection. Okay? So tradition, cover everything in purple, then they come off again when? Holy Thursday. Lent ends. Okay? When Holy Thursday. We have only one mass during that day. So we usually have 7 o'clock or 12 o'clock and evening mass on some days. On Holy Thursday, which is on Holy Week, the Mass of the Last Supper. It's the only Mass during the day, and we all come here. We attend that Mass. It's your first Holy Thursday Mass. You're becoming Catholic, okay? And a, a highlight of this Mass is, and the first Mass was the Last Supper. What did Jesus do? He washed the feet of his disciples. So it's always reenacted during the Holy Thursday night Mass, the Mass of the Last Supper. So Father will have, you know, 12 men, and he will go around and wash their feet. So an altar server would have a bowl of water and towels, and Father would just go like this, reenactment, okay? And then we'll have adoration that night until Good Friday. Good Friday, watch the bulletins and the... Website because we have all these services, Good Friday activity services, prayer, a lot of prayer. This is your first Holy Week as a Catholic. If you're going to be baptized at Easter, okay, your first Holy Week. And if you got received into the church earlier, then, uh, you know, like uh, the weekend after Holy, I mean, uh, Ash Wednesday, it is your first Holy Week, your first Lent as a Catholic, okay? So all this purple will go out, will be removed. And uh, also um, the holy water fonts, they will be empty on um, Good Friday. And then they will replenish the holy water fonts after the Holy Saturday Mass, which is the Easter vigil where you will receive all your sacraments. By the way, you're going to be coming into this room and you will be baptized right here. So you're going to be doing this and Father will baptize you. Remember, we're going to rehearse that, okay, right here. But you're going to be doing, and then you're going to be confirmed during the Mass over there for those non-Catholics who are being baptized at Easter. If you're already a Catholic, you will not be receiving your confirmation at Easter. It will be, uh, I, the date is May 25th, yeah. okay? If you're already baptized Catholic, you will be confirmed on May 25th, okay? Here, right? But if you're being baptized at Easter, this is where you get baptized, this room. This will be converted into the baptistery, you know, it's going to be renovated again. Well, they started with that wall. It's brand new. It wasn't there before. If you've been here before, you remember there wasn't a wall. Now there's a wall. Okay, now what happens at Mass? You see this small M, we talk to God. And look what's happening. We come in, we, Father greets us. We have the, I confess to Almighty God. Remember that long prayer? 
we're confessing to God and all everybody else. So it's public confession. Who said we only do it with the priest? No, we also do public confession. Then Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. You know, you hear the song, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, that's what it means. And then the glory. So at Lent, we also do not pray the Gloria. It will also be prayed. I mean, you know, at, at um, Easter vigil. Anyways, so, but normally, so it says glory, and then the opening prayer by the priest. And then we all sit down for the first reading and all. So now we talk to God first, greeting him and, and confessing, you know, repenting of our sins. Then God talks to us with what? His sacred word, the Bible. First reading, which usually the Old Testament. And then you have responsorial, the Psalms, Old Testament. Second reading is usually one of the letters, you know, in the New Testament. Then you have the gospel acclamation, the Alleluia. Then you have the gospel. Okay, so the first reading there, first reading, Psalm, second reading, guess what? We're sitting down, right? When we say the Alleluia, gospel acclamation, or during Lent, we say, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. We don't say Alleluia either, okay? So, gospel, guess what? We stand up. Why? It has prime place in the Bible. Because now is Jesus' words. He himself is speaking. The other readings, you know, you have all the other authors still speaking through the Holy, through the Holy Spirit speaking to us. But now is Jesus alive and walking, going around preaching, healing, raising people from the dead, multiplying loaves and fishes. It's Jesus Christ now among us. So we stand up. And then we do this. Did we discuss this before? Maybe not with a new group. But now we do the three times crossing. Okay. And I always said, there's no flies or bees in the church. Because people are doing this like, you know, like brushing away flies and bees. No. There's a meaning to everything we do. There's a meaning to everything we do. Just like when we do the baptismal, I mean the holy water, and we're doing this. We're recalling our baptism with water. We're also praying the Trinity, Trinitarian prayer, name Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We're protecting ourselves from the enemy because this is now a sacramental, right? This is our shield against the devil, the nuns taught us. So the bigger we, the kids, us, the bigger we made our shields, the better. Because the nuns told us this is your shield against the enemy, right? Which is true. Sacramentals, okay, blessed by Jesus through his ministers, okay? So now this gesture, which is, okay, cleanse my mind, O Lord. Purify my mind. May your love, your truth, your wisdom be on my mind. May it stay there, okay? That's what you're doing. Cleanse my lips, O Lord, that I may only speak your truth. Only good things, kind things, charitable things, and your truth and wisdom come out of these lips. This is what you're doing. Does it give you more meaning now? It's not just an empty gesture. Cleanse my mind, my lips. Cleanse my heart. Purify my heart. Occupy my heart. Lord, dwell in there. The only you, your love, your wisdom, your truth, your compassion, your love is there. And then some people, there's different customs. They might make a big cross and then the three small crosses and another big cross. But now you're not doing this like this, right? You are doing it deliberately and saying those things. Be on my mind, cleanse my mind, oh Lord, purify my mind. Let it be just you in there. So now deliberately, not slowly like, you know, no. Because you're drawing attention to yourself, which is not good, pride. But do it deliberately, not fast and hurried and no meaning, an empty gesture. Now you do it deliberately because you know what it means. Okay? That's what you're doing. Then you listen attentively. And then... Can I just ask? 
Sorry. Um, can I just ask really quick, when you were talking about the three crosses, I've never done that, and I'm just asking where in the mass are, are Oh, they? okay, when, when, it's when we all stand up, and you know, when everybody's standing up, and the deacon goes to Father, Father, you know, praise, and tell, oh, he asked Father to bless him, you know, before he goes to proclaim the gospel. Or if there's no deacon, Father goes. We, the lectors, do not proclaim the gospel. So we do the first reading, the sponsorial song by the choir, or if there's no choir, we do it. And then the second reading, we do it. But when everybody stands up, either the Alleluia, and the deacon says, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, spirit, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to, then you glory to you, O Lord. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, that's where you do it. And then God talks to us so as the homily through his priest or his deacon. He explains the readings, the gospel, gives us a reflection, gives us a teaching. Okay, now go to the small M. Now we give to God. We go up now. We give to a, we give our assent of faith, our belief. We say the creed. Now we stand up after the homily and we say, I believe, Father starts, I believe in God. And then the prayers of the faithful, you know, the petitions where we all say, you know, Lord, hear our prayer, Lord, hear our prayer. So now we give to God everything, our petitions, our needs, our wants, okay? And then the gift processional, so maybe a couple or maybe a family will be asked ahead of time, you know, that they will go to the back of the church, where the unconsecrated wine and bread host are there. And they bring it down, they go down the altar, bring it down, bring it to Father, the two containers. And Father, assisted by the altar servers, will receive those. They're not consecrated yet, okay? They put them on the altar, okay? And the preparation of the gifts, so they're now at the altar, and then the priest, the deacon, prepares everything. And then when everything's ready... Father will come to the altar, and then God gives to us. So the gifts, you know, our... So when the, the two people or the family going down there bring their gifts, you yourself, all of us, are now joining our... Everything that we have, our entire being, into this. We are going there, offering ourselves, okay? Put yourself in those containers, the cruet for the... Wine and the ciborium for the host. Okay. I know the second group did not have a tour of the church, right? The first group did. We did a tour of the church. Anyway, I have more handouts for you. And we could do that again. Because after your confirmation, you have to keep attending classes. You have more classes. And believe me, you're going to learn a lot, lot more interesting stuff. Anyway, so God gives to us now. What does he give to us himself? This is communion. The gifts are prepared. The wine and the bread are prepared to be consecrated, to become his body and blood. All those prayers. The most solemn time of the Mass is when the big miracle, biggest miracle happens, when the big word is what? Transubstantiation. The substance is changed of the wine and the bread. I'm going to do this next week, okay? What happens? A big word, transubstantiation. And then the Eucharistic prayer, very long. Here is a copy of the, I think it's just the first Eucharistic prayer. We have four Eucharistic prayers. And this one, Scripture in the Mass, is telling you every prayer that you hear so now you're, I'm hoping you're attentive at Mass. You're listening at every word that Father says and your responses besides. All those prayers have a corresponding Bible verse where it was, you know, gotten from, where that prayer was originated from. So now you know the whole Mass is scriptural. So let nobody accuse you. The Mass, you know, you guys don't do the Bible. This is an empty worship. You're worshiping idols. You go, here. Will you check the Bible verses? And then listen to our Mass. You don't want to attend Mass? Go online and listen to the Mass. See? 
If nobody wants to come to Mass with you, tell them, okay, in your own time, when nobody else is there with you, you can check out the Catholic Mass. Find out what's happening. Okay, we, we give you permission to spy on us. Spy on the Mass. And prepare to be amazed, is what you say. Okay? Invite them that way. Tell them to prepare to be amazed. And they will find it so biblical that they cannot deny it. You raised your hand, yes. Yeah, I heard a, like a bunch of stories of how people like were trying to disprove stuff and then they actually were like, oh. It's like, like Scott Brown yeah. is a famous one. Yeah. Those Protestant ministry that <laughs> became Catholic. I told you before Scott Hahn was trying to get everybody out of the church. So after he converted, he said he made a pledge that he will get everybody that he got out of the church. He's got to get them back after he discovered the Eucharist. And he went to Mass, right? He was um, he wanted to check it out. So he went to a noon Mass in... Um, where did he go? Um, wait, I knew. Where is that? In, um, I remember it was a college. Yeah, I know. Where is that college? When? Do you remember? Um, anyways, so he was spying. So he goes in the back. He wanted to check it out, right? So Scott Hahn, a scholar, good scholar, he already did about 10 years study on the book of Revelation. So he knew it, you know, inside and out. So he sits in the back, and he is marveling at what he is hearing because everything is here, he is hearing is in the book of Revelation. And at that first Mass, guess what? When he said Marquette University, that's where he was. <laughs> Are you looking it up? No, no, I was looking something else. Marquette. Anyways, so he's in the back. At the moment of here, it says the Lamb of God. Look here. After consecration, Eucharistic prayer, our Father, the peace, you know, everybody says peace. And then we say, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us three times. At that moment, and Father goes, behold, the Lamb of God, right? Who takes away the sins of the world. Scott Hahn, in his book, he said, that's the moment he said, it's true. It's true. So, he got converted at that moment. Now he's like very well known, and um, and he has a lot of students. Brad Petre, I think the one that the book that you got last week or the other week was a student of Scott Hahn. So there you go. Anyways, um, so communion time, right? Well, we have all that Eucharistic prayer like this one. So now you know the Bible is in the Mass. The Mass is in the Bible. Okay, so yeah, it's okay to replicate this. We already obtained permission. Everything that I give you, even if it says copyright, don't worry. We already obtained permission. All you say is you're doing RCAA and they go, make as many copies as you want. All right? Because they want you to know. All right? Well, there are some that would really, you know, no exception. And we don't do those. Only when they give us permission. Okay? So anyway, this too was written by... Uh, let me see. Does it say here? It's uh, John Paul Society of Evangelists. Okay. But anyway, that's just one of the four Eucharistic prayers. So can you imagine if you did the others? But it's all. it has all the biblical verses that are the prayers in the Mass. Even the responses are there. And that's just a short, you know, I mean... I'm sure you will find more verses if you did more study. But, you know, if you have at least one Bible verse that corresponds to that prayer, that's good. That's good, right? What time is it? 15 minutes. 15. Okay, after this, so you have the parts of the Mass there, okay? Now, this is a very, very neat handout. The Chronological Table of Mass Prayers. So, this one. Guys, you love these graphs, don't you? The first vertical column gives the title or first few words of the prayer. 
just like here, just like this one. The first horizontal column lists the century. An asterisk identifies those pairs of Hebrew origin which go back more than 1000 BC. The crosses indicate the century in which the existence of the prayer was known. The light shadings refer to the period when the use of the prayer was optional. The heavy shadings indicate when the prayer became obligatory in the Roman Missal. Of course, when you're talking centuries, everything's approximate, right? <laughs> okay. So there you go. History of the Mass. Where are those prayers? When did they start? What a neat handout that is. I don't know if you'll read this again, but I just give it to you. My duty is to give you, you know, neat stuff that I find. Then it's up to you. How are you going to grow your knowledge? I challenge you. Because you can never exhaust the treasure, the depth of the Catholic Church. We can stay here until, I don't know what, millennia. We will not be able to get everything. That's why I keep telling you, that's why we need eternity. Because every instant of eternity is a new glory of God that he will reveal to you and to me. You see what I mean? He's transcendent. He's too big for us. So he gives us eternity to discover him, every little thing about him. Okay? So, Mass is our central act of worship, a foretaste of heaven. So, our Protestant brothers and sisters, Scott Hahn also said, you remember this? He said, they have the menu, but we have the meal. Remember what he said? Okay, they love the Bible, which is good. They have the Bible. But, so that's the prophecy and fulfillment of Jesus. Prophecies about him, Old Testament, fulfillment, New Testament. They would have all that, right? But they won't have Eucharist, which is the fulfillment of the covenant. Jesus is the new covenant, fulfilling everything that was foretold in the Old Testament. Okay? So, um, if you have Jesus, you have everything. Okay? All of New Te Old Testament is about prophecies about him. They describe when he's going to be, who his ancestors are, what, who his parents will be. I mean, Mary and foster father Joseph. How he's going to be born, where, who's going to be there, etc. And then how he's going to live, who his friends are going to be, his disciples. How he's going to be arrested and tortured. Every detail, centuries before. And how he's going to die, how he's going to rise from the dead. And how his disciples will continue his ministry up to this moment in the 21st century. Nobody else in all of history or nobody else in the future is going to be like Jesus, where in centuries before, everything has been described, and then he fulfills everything. There's nobody, no matter how famous this person is, who has been free, pre Determined as far as his ancestor, where he's going to be born, where is this place, right? And how he's going to die. I mean, everything about him. There's nobody in history that has been predicted that way. Okay, I saw a commercial at EWT, and I meant to tell you this long before, but the, there's three people, and one lady goes, who is your, your biggest influencer? And the other one goes, he answers something else. The other one says something else. But the middle one says, my biggest influencer is Jesus Christ. Right? Isn't that true? He should be our influencer. He should be directing our lives. He should be the model, the standard of everything. Right? Who is your influencer? That's the question. You see? That's the language of today, you young folks. Okay? But, yeah, they will probably have a different word when they grow up. But right now, it's who is your influencer, 
All right? Nobody has ever been predicted in that way. And he is so big in history. We look, we count our years according to his birth. Anybody else, you know, do that with their birthday? No? Only Jesus Christ. The year of our Lord, 2024. Right? How big an influencer is that? Everything is about his birth. Before and after. Jesus Christ. And remember, here's the fullness. The church that he founded. Okay? Only God can conceive a way like this to remain with us in this consecrated host and wine. To remain with us. More of that next week, okay? I don't want to get ahead of myself because then we'll be here till 10, 10 p.m. if I start on the Eucharist, okay? Any questions so far? So, it's an act, central act of worship. Nobody else has it, okay? And in the Mass, Jesus' Paschal mystery is again made present. Again, is the same sacrifice on Calvary, bloody sacrifice. But every Mass is an unbloody sacrifice. Mystery, yes. So let's get on that one next week. But the mystery which you have to accept by faith. We'll have a little bit of understanding, you know, by facts, by history. But ultimately, bottom line, you have to accept this by faith. With the eyes of faith. Okay? So again, we lift up everything that we have experienced and we ask for protection for the following weeks, especially now you're traveling towards your sacraments. If you have experienced some weird stuff, you know, if they're not results of your own neglect and the culture around you, so they could be from the enemy, right? You could be experiencing these things, which are in a way... A good sign that you are on the right path. Because the enemy doesn't want you on the right path. So when you're walking the right path, the enemy will put all kinds of obstacles. Okay? I know I repeat this all the time, but it bears repeating. Outside of your own neglects and your own faults, you also have the culture around you, and then you have the enemy. Okay? Those are the three sources of all the troubles in your world and in my world, okay? Now, don't give the credit, the devil, too much credit because you yourself could be causing your own problems and you're letting the culture around you cause your own problems. But don't discount his power. He's very powerful. Don't give him any clues, by the way, of your weakness because he's going to work through your weakness, He's going to tempt you, tempt you, tempt you. And look at that weakness, weakness. That's his crack. That's the crack by which he will enter and destroy you eventually. But you need your tools to protect yourself, your weapons, sacraments when you receive them, the Bible, prayer, rosary, the catechism, holy objects. Remember, your blessed objects, sacramentals, prayer. All right? So let's do all that again, gather, and then direct, you know, to our Lord everything that we are, everything that we have, everyone whom we love, and everyone who needs our prayers the most. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Next week will be packed. Okay, so do not be absent, or you're going to be missing out a lot.